All right, let's take a look at this Vickers Vane motor. So we can tell it's a motor by both ports on this three-piece housing being the same size. So typically on a vane pump, the inlet would be larger than the outlet, but on a vane motor, because they're most commonly bi-directional and reversible, they'll be of equal size. We can see this is a three-piece because it's got a front housing, a center housing, and our rear housing. Now this output shaft is a keyed shaft to be able to drive into whatever the device or system that's supposed to be driven, let's say the brush on a street sweeper or an auger attachment, then it would be driven off of the output shaft here. A very common two bolt SAE mount housing. Uh, so there'll be a standardized unit. And then also we'll see our shaft seal that'll keep our hydraulic oil in the motor and whatever our uh, drive housing is separate. So if we simply separate this motor into its parts, we take a look at the rear housing here. The rear housing has a port plate in it and we can see this port plate has four slots of equal size and that would be because it is bi-directional reversible. The oil flow needs to be able to flow in either direction, but this plate here is removable from the housing itself. We may need to pop that out um, using a seal pick in a second. If we take the center housing, we can see that it's pinned to the front housing and pinned to the rear housing. We can pull these pins out. They're simply in a lining housing. And this is our motor, and we can see that this is a fixed displacement motor. It has an elliptical center housing. And so we have four transfer slots right here, and those four slots are allowed to make sure the oil on either side of the center housing has equal pressure and we don't create any cavitation. As is common with our vein motors, we see that each vein is spring-loaded to be able to push out. Now some of these springs have been popped off, and so I should and will, before I reassemble it, reset these springs and I'll, I'll show you that here uh, where we'll take a seal pick and pull these back so that this leg of the spring is actually pushing on the back side of the vein. Otherwise each of these veins should be pushed out against the cam ring. So what happens in our pumps is typically our vein pump would require a minimum of RPM so centrifugal force can throw the veins out. But since our motors start from stationary and need to begin at 1 RPM and accelerate from there, we have to start with the veins pushed out against the cam ring. And the only way to do that would be to have them spring forced or have hydraulic pressure as it comes into the port be directed into the back side of the vein and you will see both of those in industry. This one chooses to use springs and those springs are on either side of this rotor to make sure that the veins are evenly being pushed against the cam ring. Otherwise, the veins on this one are square cut. They're not a dual knife edge or a single knife edge. They're actually a square cut, which makes a lot of sense for it to be bi-directional. So in a bi-directional motor, we will see that the veins in our rotor are either going to be flat, round edge, or double knife edge, rather than a single angle cut vein. Single angle cuts are really used on pumps because they are unidirectional. Another example of a vein that is being pushed out, and this one's a double knife edged vein, again, in a balanced vein motor that's bi-directional. It has springs in behind, sorry, in behind these double knife edge veins that are being pushed out against the cam ring. So this is what's allowing oil flow to come in and immediately start movement. We don't need a minimum RPM, and this is an indicator when they have springs behind them that either they want the pump to run at a really low speed or it's a motor because then we have to be able to start delivering torque at zero rpm and accelerate from there so what we have in this motor essentially is we're going to have our a oil or our, uh, one direction let's say clockwise is a oil will come into here cause it to turn but then also into this slot here causing that rotor to turn if we sent pressurized oil into b then the would cause this rotor to turn in the opposite direction. So sending oil into the ports 180 degrees from each other 
establish the direction of rotation. Simply sending the oil in the other set of ports being done by sending it either the front or rear housing is what's going to change the direction. So our hydraulic motor's direction is set by the oil flow through the ports. So this is why commonly they're going to be called an A and a B port because they're going to be connected to the A and B port of a directional control valve rather than in and out. Those would be the terms we would use for a pump because the in is going to be connected to the tank supplying the system and the out is going to go into the system creating the flow which is restricted. So our motors, typically our work ports, are going to be called A and B. All right, so this housing here, I got to just take a look. It, it is removable. I'm just going to tap it off camera a second. So just sort of tapped it to get those parts out of there. And what we can see is that this pressure plate that would be sandwiched against the center housing and against the rotor is there for volumetric efficiency. And we can see that sealing surface right there. Okay, so the seals are what's allowing the ports to be separate from the case oil. So our work port oil can come in, get around these two passageways right here and right here to get into the work ports. And then any leakage oil, there's actually check balls. You can hear the rattling. And the check balls are actually to make sure that the oil flow, whether it's coming from the A port or the B port, is able to leak down into the center passageways here, these four ports, which dump it on top of the rotor, which allow that oil to get into the shaft and also down into the support bearings on the end of the drive shaft. So we need to make sure that whether we send the oil pressurized into A or into B, that any leakage oil or any, there is a, a redirected amount of leakage or low pressure oil uh, that's able to be sent back into the support bearings that are supporting this output shaft. Of course, it's going to be supported by bearings because it can't just sit metal on metal in the housing. That would lead to a failure. So our volumetric efficiency then of our vane motor is established by the veins being pushed against the cam ring and the squeeze of the ends of the veins being squeezed between the pressure plate right here of our end housing as well as the pressure plate shape that's cut in to the front housing on this one. So different vein motors can have these surfaces that increase volumetric efficiency be included in the housing or replaceable. Commonly, we find them replaceable in a cartridge style vein motor. So as we talk about the vein motor being indexable, this is what we're talking about. We can actually reassemble the unit properly and use it with the A and the B port instead of lined up on the same plane they can actually be 180 degrees from each other they would actually be able to be indexed 90 degrees by simply changing pulling the hardware out and rotating the end housing just like that so of course if you want to rebuild one of these and put it back in the same application, indexing and marking the housing will be very helpful to make sure you put it back in the correct orientation. But no, if you do buy a remand or a rebuilt uh, vein motor and it's been assembled incorrectly indexed, then it's quite simply just pulling four bolts and rotating the housing and putting them back in that would fix that.